<laughs> All right, why are you here to, listening to me? Um, just to, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm not from LA, I'm actually from Salt Lake City, um, but I'm down here all the time. I work for an application security services firm uh, known as Envisium. Uh, we're about 30 developers strong and all we do is application security. So everything from penetration testing, I mean, anybody here ever been through uh, PCI audit? Only three people, wow, okay. So this is gonna be fun then. Um, we go in and we do uh, penetration tests, we do source code analysis, um, anything to help you improve the security of your application, right? Uh, that's, that's our specialty. You'll, you'll run into other uh, security vendors that do everything from network scans to sell you AV. We're not that, we're all developers and we, we like code just as much as you do, hence the reason that I'm here. Um, so I, I contribute to a bunch of open source projects. We do a lot of vulnerable applications, intentionally vulnerable applications, because we see a lot of vulnerable applications. So we're trying to teach developers how not to do what we find in the wild. Um, Hacker AppSec, uh, in, in my past, I actually grew up as a Java developer. Um, if anyone remembers iOmega, do we have some iOmega? Yeah, okay, all right. The zip drive, I was not responsible for the click of death. That was not me. But those of you that had to use it, yeah, I'm dating myself. Yes, I am old, right? That's, um, I'm also a soccer hooligan. I really like, uh, you know. So if you want to talk over beers about the tire fire that is Chelsea this year, we can do that. <laughs> All right. So Node.js and security. Who here has written a Node application? All right. How many of you have written a Password checking routine. All right, just as many, okay. How many of you encrypted those passwords? How many did not encrypt the password? All right, what's your website? <laughs> All right, what I'm, what I'm here for is actually to help your application be a fortress. The last thing that we want is it to be breached, to end up like those that we see in the media, right? It's a daily occurrence that someone or your data is out there. I mean, how many of you have gotten notification letters that your information has been exposed? Right? I, I got one last week. Right? Um, it happens all the time. We've got to be very careful about it, and it's typically coming from the application itself. So when it comes down to node and security, um, what do we do? Where do we turn? Right? The first place, obviously, is the main website, right? nodejs.org. There's a security tab that's there. I don't see this in all of the frameworks that we deal with. Right? You would be surprised at how many of them it's hard to actually tell them about a vulnerability that you find in Django or something else. Um, but Node takes it very seriously. I mean, who, uh, have you all upgraded to six yet? Just came out, right? There's a couple of, I'm sure you're starting to play, play with it. Um, there's a lot of security upgrades that go along with the latest release. It's not just speed, but there's also security related to it. The great thing about Node, uh, from a security perspective, is that the developer is in, t is in charge of the entire HTTP interaction. Right? We know whether or not it's encrypted. If you think back to the old Apache days, to my Java days when we were doing web development, there was all these different layers that we didn't even care about, right? until the request got to our code and we actually did something. But with Node, we have more control over that. But that's also a bad thing, right? That's where we see a lot of problems. Your web server is only secure as you make it because you control that interaction. Node also uses JavaScript, which makes, trivial, makes it trivial to exploit server-side includes, right? Uh, another name for server-side include is cross-site scripting, if you've ever heard that term before. We're gonna talk about the OWASP top 10 because that's what we see, um, but Node has a higher level of server-side includes because of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. If we Google Node.js security, there's 1.7 million results that are out there, and this fluctuates. The last time I did this, did a presentation on Node.js security, it was like 22 million. So somehow we just lost, you know, 20 million results about Node security. It, it was all just Stack Overflow, so it doesn't matter anyway. Um, but the you know, the 
Yeah. So the sites that are listed here are what you would expect. You know, the second one is actually the Node.js security page. The first one is Rising Stack, this Node.js security checklist. If you've never seen that before, we'll talk about it a little bit, but you should definitely go check it out. Now, if we turn to the Node docs, uh, I mean, it's great that security is on the front page, but it's also not exactly what you would expect. It is all about reporting bugs in the Node platform. It's not about how we as developers use JavaScript securely. We've got to turn some other place. So if you find a problem with a module or with Node itself, this is a great resource to turn to. Otherwise, you've got to look at Rising Stack or other resources that, resources that are out there to actually fix your problems. So let's start with the security checklist from blog from risingstack.com. And this was initially just a blog post that they threw together. And they built out a full security checklist around it rather than just having a couple of points. And they changed it a little bit. Uh, so they go through uh, six or seven different things, everything from data validation, right? Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, you've heard of those. Secure transmission, are you using SSL version three? Right? You shouldn't be, right? You should be on TLS 1.2. But it talks about all these different things and how you implement that within your code or within your application. But we do have a problem here. Who's here who here has heard of the OWASP top 10? Okay, there's a couple more there, right? This is what those PCI auditors come in and they ask you whether or not your code has been checked against. So there's 10 uh, vulnerabilities that the security community and the development community, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, they release on a every three years. Right? Um, and it's people like me and the pen testers that get together and say, hey, this is what we're seeing out there, and these are the flaws that we feel are you know, the top ten for the, uh, for the web. And this falls pretty closely to what we actually see in the penetration tests that we do. Injection, right? SQL injection by far is the most devastating vulnerability that you will find or server side includes, right? That's a form of injection. If I can find that in your application, I get your database and we're done, right? Uh, there's no reason that I need to, to find anything else. It's not as common as it once was, but it's still very, very, very devastating. Um, and then it falls down there from there, right? The broken authentication session management. I don't have time to go over each of these, and so we've kind of chosen a list. The problem that I have with Rising Stack, and when I compare Rising Stack to this list, is the fact that there are four or five of these that aren't even addressed. Yes, we talk about authentication, but we don't talk about like this function level access control, insecure direct object reference. Um, these are items that can expose your application, and we do see fair in a, yeah, often when we're doing our penetration tests. Okay, so the agenda, the stuff that I want to actually cover. Um, we're going to talk about three different vulnerabilities that we see in a ton of applications at Node, um, Django, and others. I, if you've heard of them before, this will, there'll be a short review on it. Um, and then um, I'm going to talk about the tools that are available. Right? There, there's uh, the Node Security Project that has a tool that you should be running against your code. Um, but um, it's also a call for help. I mean, if you're developing modules, we got to talk about it. It's got to be secure, right? If other people are depending on your code and it fails, um, it exposes us all. All right, so I want you to develop a security mindset. This all comes down to trust. Trust in your application, trust um, that your users have with your application, that you can defend against attackers. Right? Um, given the breaches that are out there, your application is only going to stand up for a certain amount of time. It may be that there's a problem with Node and it's not your code and they're going to be able to break in eventually or they're going to be able to fish one of your users or one of your employees. It's only a matter of time. But you don't want to be that low-hanging fruit. You don't want to be the one with SQL injection that causes that data to be breached. So you've got to trust that your application is at a specific level. You've got to be able to trust that you can recover when there is a problem, whether that's backups or you know your application, you can spin up more systems, however that needs to happen. Your users have to be able to trust your application. They're going to they're gonna have to trust that they can put credit card information into it. If they don't, you know, you're going to lose sales or whatever else. And most importantly, your product or your application should not trust its users. This is where we see the majority of attacks. And this doesn't matter if it's employees that are internal to your network. If you give too much trust out, 
it's going to be exploited at some point. It may be you know, 50 years from now, but it's going to be exploited at some point. All right, so let's jump into the first vulnerability. I said I was a soccer nerd, just deal with it. A um, couple years ago, I was headed to London and I wanted to go catch a match. I wanted to go see Chelsea play, but of course, I, you know, the way that they do their you know, season tickets, they only let people that aren't season ticket holders buy things like two weeks before the match. I'm here in the States. They go on sale at like 7 a.m. in the UK, which means it's like midnight or you know, 11 p.m. here. I'm staying up late to, to actually order these tickets. And I get, in, I get in about 10 minutes before, log into the site, and I get to the order entry page, and it just says, please wait. Uh, you will be able to order tickets you know, when your turn is up, right? And this page just keeps reloading every about 30 seconds or so. And of course, I'm bored. Right? So I take a look at the URL, and what do I see? Okay. In this case, it was a Java application, and I see a group, group ID of seven. What group ID do I want to be in? One, of course, right? Okay, we're all smart. Zero, yeah. I didn't want to crash the application. I wanted to be able to order tickets. Yeah, good. So group ID one, I'm like, oh great, if this works, this is gonna be awesome. So I bring up another browser, I load up the pages, right, and it starts loading, and then I change it to group ID one. All right, any guesses on how the difference between when I could order with one versus seven? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Hey, had I been actually in a line in London for a ticket? Yeah, I would have gotten, yeah, I, I would have been dead. But, you know, here, I, since I, I, I could look and see what was going on with the application, I could take advantage of it. I still paid for them. Don't worry. Don't worry. I still paid for them. <laughs> so, IDOR, insecure direct object reference, this is the vulnerability that's so easy that my grandmother has done it, right? She started typing, she thought she was in a text field, and really she was in the URL bar, she hit enter, and the application did something unexpected. There was an error message or there was something else that happened. Right? We're seeing a rise in the number of instances of insecure direct object reference. It used to be that it seems like we had the authorization figured out, right? I shouldn't be able to change my group ID. There's no reason why I, as a user of the application, should see that information but the application trusted me, and I was able to manipulate that trust and take advantage of it. The only, uh, the only piece of information that's needed to execute an insecure direct object reference attack is the identifier value. So the group ID value, um, the ID value of your billing for your, for your electricity, right? Yes, that happened to me, but it's all over the place, right? Um, and just because you have some identifier that is a random number, uh, yes, that makes it more difficult to execute, but that does not mean that the authorization is in place. So we may be able to pull that URL out of different places, whether that's some web proxy or something like that, or if you're sniffing uh, wireless traffic you know, in a public location such as this. You may be able to see someone else's information, and if they don't check properly, you may be able to access it as well. All right, so here's an instance. Uh, this is stolen from NodeGoat. Uh, NodeGoat is the OWASP project that is a vulnerable node application, um, intentionally vulnerable, I should say. Um, and you can see the same problem here as I was discussing. Uh, in this case, you know, uh, we're taking the user ID directly from the request parameters and then we're processing, we're pulling information back out of the data access object and presenting it to the user. This isn't a problem when the user ID corresponds with the logged in user ID, but it is a problem if I change that value. If I change the value from three to four, what happens? I probably see number four, whoever's ID is associated with number four. So how would we fix this? Say that again? Middleware. Middleware? What specifically? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I could check and see, I mean, I'm pulling a request param, I've got a user ID there. Really, why am I even trusting that to come from the user, right? Shouldn't I, shouldn't I be pulling that from a session object? Yeah. Encrypted session object. Yeah, Encrypt, encrypted session object, yeah, if that's passed to them, we don't care because they can't do anything to it besides mess it up, right? Cool, so that's just it, right, uh, on a 
you know, code level, all we really need to do is check to see if the user has access before we present them anything. Um, we should do this on the controller level, not the route level, because sometimes there's multiple routes to a single controller. Right? Um, and the closer we put the check to the data, the more, I mean, the easier it's going to be because we're not going to have to uh, comb through as much code to present them. So insecure direct object reference. We can talk more about it if you have other questions when we get into it. Okay, CSRF. Has anybody here dealt with CSRF before? Sweet. That's more than I expected. All right, somebody tell me what is CSRF. Cross-site request forgery. All right, that's a fancy word. What does that mean? Yeah, okay. All right, so we're, we're close here, right? Okay, there's two flaws here that the app, that uh, the vulnerability takes advantage of, and they're listed up here. First, the web application processes all requests that include authorization cookies. No questions asked, right? They use that for identification and authorization. You set a cookie, um, and the application accepts it. It says, hey, that's associated with this user, so I know that I should process that. Now, that's not really a flaw. That's a feature, right? That's, that's stateless HTTP. But the browser automatically sends cookies to a host as long as it has a cookie for that host in the cookie jar. So how could we take advantage of that? Yeah. Yeah, so if we can figure out a way to send a request on a site that's not associated with, you know, onlinebank.com, we may be able to transfer money somehow, right? Normally it's going to be hard because majority of cross operations are over post to put, which forbids this. So usually it's a get request that are subject to this. Hey, man, we're JavaScript developers. Can you not figure out how to send a post request? <laughs> but, it, but normally you have to actually uh, inject the URL into like a forum link behind a hidden picture. So you click on me, and then it turns into a link that says transfer money or $10,000 to my account. It's, yeah. it's usually like two things, right? Either uh, for some reason there's mutation behind a get request. Like mm -hmm. signing out a get link or a, a link, right? Yeah. Or the second thing is a user was allowed to post uh, their own script specifically and comment and evaluate. Yeah. Right? But yeah, so. You would think, but the, so, okay, CSRF though, I mean, we're getting kind of confused between CSRF and cross site scripting, because cross site scripting, a lot of that is I'm able to inject a script onto your page somehow, right? Cross site request forgery is. I have an image tag on my blog that makes a request to onlinebank.com. And if your browser already is logged in to onlinebank.com, it includes your cookies with that request. That's a problem. It's also known as session writing. That makes sense, right? I'm writing on top of a session that you already have with onlinebank.com. Netflix was one of the first, uh, you know, big, companies that we found to be vulnerable to this. And this is back in the day when they actually sent out DVDs. Again, I'm aging myself. But when they sent out DVDs rather than you know, so much streaming, I think they still do that. Um, but it was very easy. Like Everything was done via a Git request. So I could add a movie to your queue. You, know, you really like SpongeBob, right? I could move it to the top of the queue. I could change your address, right? So I could ship it to me. Heck, I could even just change the password and take over your account um, because they were all these simple get requests. So the mitigation, right, uh, the thing that we came up with, initially it was like, oh, well, well post, post will take care of it. And we're like, wait a second, I can do, on my blog, I have control of everything. I can do an XML HTTP request to onlinebank.com just as easy as I can do an image tag. So I can post things inside of a you know, an iframe or something else and still execute this attack. Um, so what we've done is we've introduced another token that has to be associated with any request that is sensitive. Something that's random that the attacker can't actually look up. If I can't predict what that post request should look like or that get request should look like, it's very hard to execute this attack. It's impossible. 
So there's middleware that's out there and available. Node.js does not do this by default. Um, you've got to wire it up, like Express has this C surf uh, middleware. Um, there's also the C surf, C S U R F middleware that does the same thing, but you've got to wire it up, right? You've got to actually add that to your session object. You've got to tell it which views you're concerned about. You've got to embed that CSRF token in there. And those are all uh, encrypted and you know, they've already been checked and validated. Um, it's auto-validated when it sees it come in on any of these different locations, the CSR, the body, the query, or in a, head, in a header. But there are issues with it, right? It uses math.random and the session secret to create that token value. Um, Express actually ignores tokens and get option and head, re head requests. That could be a problem, right, for Netflix. If we ignore get requests, we just didn't do anything by you know, dropping it in there. Uh, method override, there's, our, there's ways to get around it. Um, the most interesting to me is the session secret one. Right? If you go out to GitHub and do a quick search for session secret and express session. <laughs> okay, granted, not all of these are going to be valid. But 116,000 instances, right? I, I thought that most of those are Rails applications. Only as of like 4.0 did they start putting environment variables for session secret and just get rid of that. It's yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so there's tons of them out there. I mean, this one's specific for JavaScript, though, right? This search. OK. All right. Now, I found an interesting thing as I combed through, through these results. Over 6,000 of them was the same thing. Any guesses? Any guesses? It, it's something. Password? Can, <laughs> secret? You're close. You're close. <laughs> Keyboard cat. Oh, those of you that are Express are like, oh, yes, of course it is, right? Because that's the default for Express is keyboard cat. So they just cloned it. They just copied it and went away. So 6,300 of them are keyboard cat. So, there you go. <laughs> All right. So further on mitigation, right? Your secret must be a secret, right? Whether it's a, some sort of environment variable that you store that in. Um, you got to make sure that's on any sensitive form. You got to periodically check for CSRF and you got to do QA tests. Like, don't tell the other security guys, but you know, us as pen testers, we're really just glorified QA testers, right? That, that's it. We just run security tests instead of QA tests. So you can check for this stuff. It's very, very easy to use JS Lint or something like that and actually write a test to check for CSRF. Do you consider cores also a way of mitigating CSRF? Say that again. Do you consider cores to be a way of mitigating CSRF? Um, cores. Tell me what cores is. Oh, it's the thing when the browser makes a request before every request, an option request. Asking to see if oh. allowed? Not necessarily. Okay. I think you can still get around that. I, I mean, the way that the, the Java, I, I mean, when you have control of that page, it's very easy to actually make that initial request as well. Well, no, because the browser does it for you. Mm -hmm. You don't make the initial request. The browser will as well as your request. In fact, it'll make an options request for your options request. Of course, actually enables CSRS. Yeah, it, it, it might. I'd, I'll, have to, I'll have to play with it a little bit and actually see. Um, but but let's, let's talk about it a little bit in the break, OK? All right, so business logic flaws. I know I'm pushing it here. Um, basically, this is anywhere that we could bypass steps or change, the, change how the application works by you know, just looking at the flow of an application. Right? Where are the decisions made? We could take advantage of Node.js, the asynchronous function calls. Like We really love Node because we can do asynchronous. But there's problems with it, and we'll show you one of them here in a second. Um, again, this is simple trust issues. I'm showing a, a, an example here. Uh, there's a, um, yeah, there's, a, there's an amusement park by where I live that we get season ticket tickets to every year because we have kids, and it's a great way to actually go spend a Sunday afternoon or whatever, right? Um, a couple years ago, I'm looking at the site. And I'm bored. Right? This is how all my stories start. I'm bored. Um, and I see season, you know, individual season passports, $109, $110. Granted, that's not Disneyland prices, but that's still too expensive, right? So let's look at the post, right? As it's sending this information to the application on the back end, we, see, we notice a couple different parameters that are being sent. One of them happens to be price. I'm like, oh, sweet, price. Right? I can manipulate price. I can play with that. Uh, what does the equal sign mean? 
Sweet, base64 encoding. I base64 decode it, oh, it's some encrypted value. Dang it. But then I look and see, hey, there's a shipping fee there. Anybody, any guesses as to what the shipping fee is for something you print out yourself? Zero. Yeah, it's a nice big old fat zero. <laughs> so of course, that's what we do is we take that, we change it, and we actually post that request back to the server. <laughs> Woohoo! and they're now free. <laughs> But I, I'm not a monster, I'm still paying the processing fee, okay? <laughs> All right, so this is what I'm talking about. You know, business logic flaws, they're trusting the user, I'm able to bypass their price check, right? They're trusting me with that information. All right, so here's, here's some actual code. Um, this takes advantage of, this is a flaw in, in goat.js um, that actually, allows me to do something bad, right? I'll give you 30 seconds, tell me what it is. I don't know, can everybody assignment see operator. Okay, first of all, okay, let's get that out of the way, assignment operator, yes. New password confirmation is always gonna be the password, right? But that's not the, that's not the main flaw. Say that again? Yep, it, it, def it assumes the is match is correct, but why is that a problem? Okay, I'm putting username in the body, but wh what am I doing to actually flip is match to false? Using a, I'm, I'm using a callback. Why would that be an issue? Yeah, the callback is not going to return soon enough to actually flip is match to, tr to false if I don't put in the correct password. So it doesn't matter what password I actually put in there for the current password, we can change it. And I can show you how this works. Well, let's see if we can pull this up really quick. All right, so here's goat.js. Um, this is a work in progress, it hasn't been released yet, but this is one that will be in there. So if you log in as admin, current password is admin. Right? We go to the My Account page, there's our current password, this is the code that's sitting in front of it. Um, if I put in a one, that's obviously not our current password, and I change our password to test, an update, I don't get an error message, I don't know if it, I don't know if it actually took, and the only way to test it is to log back out, Log back in. Okay, so let's try admin, because it should still be admin, but that doesn't work, right? So it actually executed my attack, right? I was able to change the password because of the way that Node handles those function callbacks, right? And if I wasn't careful, right, I mean, I, I was trying to exploit this, obviously. But if you're not careful with how you handle authentication and authorization routines, with callbacks, this can be the problem. You run into race conditions, you run into you know, login issues that you're checking the password or you're actually presenting information back to the user before they've given you the proper credentials to get to it. So anytime you're handling uh, sensitive data or you're handling a sensitive function, you gotta be sure that your asynchronous and synchronous calls line up properly. Again, don't trust any user input, right? I might be on the other end and I might be bored. That's, yeah. uh, wait for asynchronous, use the async library if you need to wait, right? Or make sure that you're doing it in the proper steps and test it. Right? Make sure that it passes tests. Okay, all right, so defense, um, strategy, tests, right? That's really what it comes down to. If you look at the SCLC, you know, you should test in, on the developer desktop before they actually move something to production. QA test, production test. That's, that, that's where we find the, the, all these vulnerabilities. And then start over, teach yourself. Go to blogrisingstack.com, go to seccast.com. There's, there's resources that are out there that'll teach you these things, And because we can't cover it all right now. Um, library security and then security middleware, we'll talk a little bit about it. All right, NPM. Let's talk about NPM really quick before I'm out of here. Uh, 437 new modules a day. How many of you are module authors? I thought there was, there was a few, all right. How many of you have tested your code for security? All right, good, good. <laughs> um, so when we talk about NPM, there's a ton of new code that's out there. 
and we don't, uh, you know, we, I don't know if I should trust it. Right? In general, I probably would lean towards no, um, but that's just me. So it's like, all right, there's the node security project. At least these guys are looking at the code. Do you really think that three guys in San Francisco can look at 437 new modules a day? Any guesses as to how many advisories they put out in 2016? There's at least three, right? <laughs> so let's just start there and... <laughs> All right, sweet. Four? 25. 25. How many for all of 2015? <laughs> a little bit more than that, 37. Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm sure the, um, the other, you know, 260,000 packages, they're fine. Just don't worry about it. Right? Uh, uh, I mean, no package would ever do anything malicious. <laughs> That's bad. Don't install Rim Rafal. Just don't do it. But it's still out there, right? I, I went and looked. This was uh, one of our security guys was like, hey, I wonder if I could push this into NPM. They create a module. There's no actual code there. There's just the pre-install script. That's bad, right? And it's still there, right? You could go and install it if you wanted to. That's what we put a package Yeah, I know it is. Yeah, but there's no code. Yeah, it, look, this is it. 16 lines. That's it. Okay. Anyway. So we've got a couple tools that are out there for us that we can use to actually check our code. Retire.js will tell us the old libraries that exist that have updates currently and vulnerabilities in them. Um, this one, I'm just doing it against another vulnerable application. Uh, there's also NSP from the Node Security Project. All that does is it looks at their database and compares it to the modules in your code to see whether or not you're using something that is vulnerable. So in this case, you know, Goat.js is using SQLize that is vulnerable to SQL injection. Right? So this is where we we can start to integrate some of these tools into our build process to see if we if we have problems before we push code to production. In addition, security training, if you've never played with a vulnerable application or you want to, there's multiple resources out there. The Node Goat project, like I talked about, uh, the damn vulnerable node application. There's a series of damn vulnerable applications that are out there. There's a Node one, there's an iOS one, what, whatever, what have you. But go, go test them out. Go pull it down. Just don't run it on your production instance, right? Don't run it in AWS. Just run it locally. You'll be fine. Goat.js will be coming out soon. Um, you can follow me and I'll, you know, I'll let you know where the status is. That'll just be out on GitHub. There's tools that are out there that you can use, uh, the static analysis tools. We can talk more about this later um, if you're interested in actually using some of these. I do see some problems with them as far as the amount of false positives and the amount of time it takes to actually parse these resources. And they are typically geared towards single pages files. You're better off running JS Lint and writing your own tests usually than using the static analysis tools, but it could give you some value if you got the money to spend on them. Um, so my list for what you should do tomorrow with your application. One, implement Express, Helmet, Kraken, right? Uh, they already have a bunch of libraries and middleware built in that'll secure your application even more. Go read blog, uh, the Rising Stack checklist, that's one of their recommendations. Check your source code repos for secrets. Right? Even if it's shared amongst your, you know, just internally, make sure that you're not pushing that stuff to a place that it shouldn't be. Uh, test check for IDOR. It's very easy to change a three to a four. How is request params being handled by your application? Are you trusting that data more than you should? Run NSP, retire JS, and then, you know, when you have the time, Google Node Goat and actually go try out some of these. Anything that you've never seen before, go test out. If you haven't played with cross-site scripting or SQL injection, it's kind of fun. Right, to go break an application. Just don't do it on the normal web. Don't be bored. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, my conclusion here, security is hard. Try harder. If you need help, let me know. Um, but thanks for hosting. And are there any questions before I call it? All right, well, if there's questions, come up and we can talk during the break. Thank you. Thank you.